Thank you. Welcome, everyone. As Laura said, I'm John Hayes. Uh, we're not going to get into too much of the Hayes family farm side of things today. There's a lot of ground to cover here with the six principles of soil health. We could spend this entire conference talking about that. Uh, so 50 minutes isn't even enough time to give it much justice. Uh, start out with, you know, how do we nurture soil health? And before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about health. You know, is our health important? I think everybody would agree, yes, our health's important. Without our health, what else do we have? You know, that, that's where everything starts. Uh, we might be living longer today, but are we, are we healthy? Maybe, maybe not. There's a lot, the degenerative diseases continue to rise uh, in our communities. Health healthcare costs continue to rise. So I'd pose the question, is our health related to soil health? And I, I believe it is. Uh, there's a saying that goes around, you're all familiar with, we are what our food eats. So... Uh, Can we build soil health? Yes, we can build soil health. Uh, a lot of different ways to go about that. A lot of different, a lot of different methods have been tried. Some successful, some not so successful. Uh, but the question today we're going to deal with is how do we build soil health? And I would suggest that we can build soil health by applying the principles of regenerative agriculture. It doesn't matter where we are or what we're growing, but these principles remain true everywhere. We can, you know, we could, we can be here in central Indiana growing vegetables, livestock, corn, soybeans, wheat. We can go to the other side of the world. These principles are still going to work wherever we are. So, uh, just a brief introduction about me. I would. I've considered myself a lifelong learner, student of life. I do a lot of reading. Uh, like Laura said, I've been actively farming for over 40 years. And if it can be done wrong, I've probably done it wrong before. So I try to learn from my mistakes and then try to improve things as, as I go. As it says on the slide here, uh, I've, been, I've tried many different ways over the years to farm in synchrony with nature. Uh, cover crop for many, many years in the garden setting, some in a row crop setting. Uh, we've uh, currently were primarily a forage based operation. At one time that was a large commercial hay operation, uh, which I thought was heading in a better direction for soil health. And as I watched things progress over 10 or 15 years, I realized that it was not a better way for soil health. I saw, I saw the health of the soil continue to degenerate. So I started scratching my head wondering what was going on and, and looking for some answers and came across regenerative farming principles and believe that that's certainly the answer. So in 2021, I made the commitment to follow the regenerative farming principles to advance soil health under our management. And I'm very excited about the results that we're seeing, the results that other people have been doing this much longer than myself are seeing. There's people out here that have been uh, practicing these principles for over 20 years and, and having some amazing results. So it gives us a lot of hope, I think, for agriculture and, and the, the future of the natural resources that we have. And I'm very passionate about sharing that with others, which is why I'm standing here today. So, what is regenerative agriculture? Uh, understanding ag has a definition for it that I really like. And it's simply farming and ranching in synchrony with nature to repair, rebuild, revitalize, and restore ecosystem function, starting with all life in the soil and moving to all life above the soil. If you're not familiar with understanding ag, uh, I'm going to refer to them a fair bit today because I've learned a lot of what, what I know and what I practice from that organization. Uh, it's, it's made up, well, it was founded by uh, several 
people that are somewhat considered pioneers in the regenerative farming circle. Uh, Dave Brandt, who passed away last year, was one. He lived over in Ohio. Uh, Gabe Brown, who most people are probably familiar with. Uh, Ray Archuleta, uh, former NRCS. And uh, Dr. Alan Williams. Currently, Dr. Alan Williams and, and Gabe Brown are both still part of that organization. So, uh, very, very good resource there, which there's some resources at the end of the presentation here, and, and, and they are listed. <clears throat> Start out with, we don't know what we don't know. And myself included in this for, you know, for many years, I thought I knew a little bit of something about agriculture and soil health and, and, and I did, but there was a lot of things that I didn't know and a lot of things I've learned in the last few years that have really changed the way I look at things and the way I see things. Uh, there's a major lacking of education and understanding about basic soil health and soil function in our society. And once we begin to study these principles, there's, there's a lot of aha moments with people that's, oh yeah. Uh, so soil in, in many circles has just become a medium just to hold the plant upright. And then we're going to put all the inputs in there that we can to, to support that plant while it's growing. Uh, typically the focus is put on soil chemistry and or technology. And both of those things have, have come a long, long way as far as advancements. Uh, but there's another way to look at things and that's, and that's the education piece or the lack of understanding piece that I think, or that I want to talk about today. And that's biology. Biology is the key to soil health. And if we can do things to promote biology within the soil, the, the soil will become healthier, it'll start functioning properly, and maybe we don't need as many commercial inputs. As we all know, they keep getting more expensive. <clears throat> so what promotes soil biology? Uh, carbon. Carbon really drives the whole system. And I'm not talking about carbon credits, but I'm talking about the actual carbon. Uh, the six principles of soil health drive or, or promote the environment for soil biology to work properly. So biology can correct the chemistry for us if we'll let it. And, but we must create an environment for the biology to flourish. What does soil, or what does healthy soil look like? Well, first it's well aggregated. You say, what's, what's aggregated? That's something that not that long ago, I really didn't have a very good grasp on was what, what well aggregated soil looked like, even though I'd seen it many times in my life. Uh, it, that it looks similar to chocolate cake. It has a good smell to it. Let's just, you know, what, what is a soil aggregate? It's simply particles of sand, silt, and clay bound together uh, by biological glues. And I won't go into all the science behind that just for the sake of time. And there's people that are even better at just explaining that than what I am. So, but why is, why is aggregation important? Um, it's a key indicator to how well soil is functioning and how much life is in your soil. When, when you have a well aggregated soil, the only reason it's that way is because the biology is working. If the biology is not working, you won't have aggregation. Uh, it creates pathways for water and air to infiltrate the soil. It creates an environment for the nutrients to cycle properly. How long does an aggregate last? Uh, I've heard said that typically not more than about three or four weeks. So we have to constantly be rebuilding the aggregates in the soil. And we're going to do that through biology in the soil. So when we have well aggregated soils, the four ecosystem processes are able to function properly. Here's a picture of, you know, I don't know what that looks like out there, but there's a picture of well aggregated soil. 
You can see an earthworm right in there. You look at this, it, it, things are kind of clumped together. And if you go dig around out, if you go dig around out in a, say, an in row in a cornfield, you're not going to find this. But if you go dig around in the fence row that hasn't been farmed for the last 40 or 50 years, you will likely find soil like this, especially if there's a lot of grass growing there. So where do we start? Uh, let's start with talking about the four ecosystem processes, what they are, just a little bit of how they work, and then we'll move into the six principles. Uh, so the four ecosystem processes are energy flow, water cycle, mineral cycle, and diversity, or sometimes called community dynamics. Energy flow is simply sunlight being converted into a photosynthetic material that goes into the soil and, and feeds the life in the soil. Energy flow is all about solar energy or photosynthesis. Um, unlike the water cycle and mineral cycle, solar energy does not cycle, but it just flows. So it flows from the sun to the earth. It's necessary, obviously, for everything on the planet to survive. So the, the importance of an adequate solar panel uh, to capture that energy, we're going to talk a little bit about that as we go through this today. Uh, plant leaves are that solar panel, and we want as big a solar panel as we can possibly have to collect that solar energy and, and convert it into a usable material within the soil. So leaving enough plant material behind, in other words, the solar panel for this process to occur is critical to all life. You know, if we've got no solar panel on the soil, we've got no way to, to uh, have this energy flowing. And it's the, it's the leaves on the plants that, that are that solar panel. How much sunlight are you capturing in your growing operation or wherever else you may be? Water cycle, uh, it's not how much rain you get, but how much rain you keep. If we get a, say we get a three quarter of an inch rain and it all soaks in the ground, awesome. But if half of it runs off down the stream, then what good was that water to us? You know, so again, it's how much rain we keep, not how much rain we got. Uh, so when, when rain or snow falls on the land, we're responsible for its fate from that point forward. Will it infiltrate and be retained, or is it going to run off? Is it going to pond, pool, and evaporate? Will it cause erosion and harmful runoff to others? Can we keep it, or do we lose it? An interesting fact about uh, organic matter, which that, that's that's what holds water in the soil is the organic matter. But every 1% increase in organic matter holds an additional 20,000 gallons of water per acre or, or nearly one acre inch of water. How much water are you capturing in a rain event? You getting all of it or just part of it? The mineral cycle be the third of the four ecosystem processes. Uh, the mineral cycle is a complete exchange uh, that occurs with the soil microbiology, or not a complete, a complex exchange that occurs with soil microbiology. It's cycling the nutrients from unavailable form to available form and back again. The three phases of an effective mineral cycle are one, moving minerals from below the soil surface to above. Two, placing those minerals on the soil surface. And three, uh, moving minerals from above the soil surface back into the soil. And on the note of moving minerals back into the soil, nitrogen is obviously a big, a big nutrient that we're always concerned with. Uh, interesting fact that 78% of the air we breathe is nitrogen. So not, not a lot of nitrogen floating around here, but yeah, we're we're constantly buying nitrogen and adding nitrogen to, to our soil to, to make up for a improperly functioning mineral cycle. 
Uh, the mineral cycle is a critical part of a larger carbon cycle and is enabled by a highly functioning water cycle. Grazing, foraging, or yeah, grazing, foraging, and browsing animals are an important, important part of this process. We're going to talk about that a little more later. So more on the mineral cycle. Uh, this kind of came as a shock to me when I first heard this, but our soils aren't deficient in minerals, but they're just deficient in available minerals, the available in plant form. Uh, there's a soil test that's called the total nutrient digestion, digestion test. There's been many samples taken across this country and, and around the globe that what the soil, the total nutrient digestion test does is just measure all the nutrients available in both available and, in, and unavailable form within the soil. And it's been discovered that there are no deficiencies of minerals in any one of these tests anywhere in the world. So you're probably thinking, well, why are, we, why are we adding nutrients all the time? Why are we putting fertilizer on? Well, it's because the mineral cycle, again, is not functioning as well as it could. And then we're required to come along and, and put commercial or added inputs on. So is your mineral cycle functioning properly? How many applied nutrients are you using? The fourth uh, pro ecosystem process, diversity, uh, Lakota, the, the Native American tribe, the Lakota or the Sioux Indians, they're often, they, they have a term or a word that I won't try to pronounce, but it essentially means all are related. And that's not, that doesn't mean all of us as human beings are related, but that everything in life is related. They're, each thing has its own uh, purpose, but but we're all intertwined and, and we're all designed to, whether it be us and the plants or the animals or the or the microbiology in the soil, but it, everything's designed to work together in this community dynamic situation. <clears throat> uh, this process is also sometimes called biological succession. It involves the changes in development of all living things. And a fundamental rule of succession says that a species will move into an environment when the conditions are suitable for its establishment and will move out of that environment when conditions become unsuitable for its reproduction. I think there was some talk about that with your uh, composting up there. Yep. So are you promoting or discouraging diversity in life? How do we support the four ecosystem processes? Well, I would suggest that we support them with the six principles of soil health. And those six principles are know your context, keep the soil armored, minimize disturbance, keep a living root in the soil, diversity, and livestock integration. And we're going to go into a little more detail on each one of these six. Uh, the first principle, know your context. Our soil health practices are a reflection of ourselves and our stewardship of the land. Uh, context is so important with what we're doing because uh, of, of many different things. But, you know, ask yourself, what are you trying to accomplish? What's the historical context of, of this piece of ground? Uh, is what I'm wanting to do suitable for my environment? Is it suitable for my management style? Is it suitable for my lifestyle? Uh, are you and the people that are working with you on board with, with this idea, whatever it is we're doing? Uh, or what are your financial resources? Peer pressure is sometimes a concern. You know, what, what's my next door neighbor think of what I'm doing? You know, there, I was in a session earlier, and I, the, the guys mentioned I got I got to till in real straight rows because if I don't, the neighbors are going to look at me funny. So <laughs> it's it, it's a sin to plant crooked rows of corn. So 
con context is very important. That, that principle has, in more recent years, been added as, as a sixth principle, so to speak. These other five principles have been recognized for much longer, but uh, context has been added in here, and, and, and rightly so, I believe. So, is there anything wrong with the context in this picture here? You know, just put that, I picked that out there, you know, the, that, that's a commonly accepted practice there. We've all eaten beef that's come from that practice, but, you know, what's wrong with the context there? <laughs> yeah, they're standing out there in dirt and the sun and, um, Second principle uh, is keep soil surface armored. I guess I should say, along, as we go along through here, if there's any questions, just let's let's discuss some of those. Uh, hopefully, there'll be some time at the end for questions. But as we go through, I'm happy to entertain some questions as well. Second principle: keep the soil surface armored. Uh, nature does not like bare soil. It's always trying to cover and protect itself, and Every time you go out there and you, you till the soil up and you plant a crop in it, uh, whether the crop comes up or, or not, you'll find that this is true. What happens? Something's going to grow. Yeah, we get what we call weeds. Uh, so think of armor as the skin on the soil. And proper armor reduces or prevents water evaporation. Proper armor keeps soil temperatures conducive for life in the soil. Uh, soil temperatures above 90 degrees begin to inhibit biological activity. And when you start getting up around 140 degrees, you start killing life in the soil. Some a little bit earlier than that, some a little bit later than that. But uh, the, the temperature of the soil is, is very important to the microbiology. There's a slide here in a minute that illustrates that really well. So with proper armor... The soil life or the biology will begin building aggregation from the surface down. Uh, the mineral cycle will begin to function properly. And back, you know, you're going to see aggregation come up here in this presentation a fair bit. Of, and aggregation, as far as I know, always begins right there at the soil surface, at or near the soil surface, and it starts working deeper and deeper if we continue to promote the environment for that to happen. But it won't start down here and work its way up. It's always starting at the surface and working its way down. Uh, and carbon feeds this entire system. The more biology in the soil, the more carbon is needed to feed that biology. The carbon is the food for the biology. This slide here is probably one of the most important slides I've seen uh, in regards to promoting soil health. And down here at the bottom, it says the ideal range for nitrification in plant growth uh, is 65 to 86 degrees. So right here in this range, when the soil temperature starts getting up here around 90 degrees, it start, the plant growth starts slowing down. 100 degrees, uh, we're starting to see evaporation. And we get up, we get up here a little higher. Bacteria, some bacteria starts dying. We get way up here, 130 degrees. 100 percent of the moisture in the soil is simply evaporating. So, uh, and then, like I said a minute ago, once we get up there around that 140 mark and above, soil bacteria or soil biology starts dying. So. Can't say enough about the importance of of uh, soil temperature, and the way to keep that soil temperature in check is to have some armor on the soil. You know, you if you've ever gone out and well, what, like when you got a big stand of hay, maybe first cutting the hay, you're out there and the stuff's up here, waist higher, higher. You reach down there and that's near the soil surface. Everything's nice and cool. It's right, it's down here in this range, even if it's 80, 90 degrees outside. Everything's cool down there. You start looking around, you start seeing lots of life. 
and there's lots of evidence of life right there on the surface of the soil. And you take the hay mower out there and you mow it off about this tall, and then you rake it and you bale it. What happens? The sun starts beating down on it. You've got a lot of bare ground exposed. That soil temperature starts rising. And what happens to your soil life? It starts going. Uh, this slide here is an example of soil armor. Uh, I took this out in the garden the other day. Uh, we, we enjoy growing some garlic and we no-till our garlic into a nice uh, mulch bed like this right here. So lots of armor on this soil. You know, sun can shine on it, not going not gonna to raise the soil temperature. And it's also keeping that moisture in the soil. The third principle is minimize disturbance. In nature, there is no mechanical or, dis or chemical disturbance in the soil. Uh, mechanical disturbance, which uh, essentially most commonly is tillage, releases carbon from the soil into the atmosphere and leaves the soil surface unprotected. Tillage destroys aggregation. I'm not saying that you sh shouldn't till, but you ought to at least think about what you're doing when you are tilling because uh, there might be times you deem it necessary to do some tillage, but recognize what it's doing to soil health and try to try to work with that in mind. Because again, when, when you till, you are going to destroy soil aggregation. You're taking, you're taking the process backwards when you do tillage. So if you know that and understand that, you, you might be able to incorporate tillage where, where it's truly necessary, but, uh, but you're going to know what you're working with. Chemical disturbance also inhibits life in the soil. You know, every, well, synthetic fertilizers are not necessarily fall under this category, but uh, all of the herbicides, the pesticides, the fungicides, all those things we put on those. What is a side? You know, side, side equals death, right? So anytime we put one of those sides on the soil, we're killing something. And we're not just killing the thing that we're targeting, but we're killing many other beneficial things along with it. So think about that as you're applying chemicals. And again, there, there might be a place, you know, we can sit here and debate that all day long, but there might be a place to use, to use certain uh, chemicals, certain pesticides, but just understand what you're working with again and, and, and use them accordingly. You know, in the, in the regenerative space, there's, there's, there's purists that won't use any of this stuff. And then there's people that are practical and say, okay, well, we still have to raise the crop and make a living. And I, I think you can find some balance in there. You know, they're, they're oftentimes just for practical reasons. You might have to, to use some chemicals. You might have to do some tillage. You might have to put some fertilizer on. Uh, but the key is to minimize the disturbance. And if you keep that to, if you keep the disturbance to a minimum, you're going to promote the life in the soil. Uh, this is some cabbage we planted last, late last summer for fall cabbage. Uh, we no-tilled the transplants into heavy soil armor, so there's essentially no disturbance to the soil, plenty of armor on the soil. Uh, there's some other living plants in here, which we'll talk about a little more later. I don't get, to, I don't get concerned with those like I used to. Matter of fact, now I kind of welcome them. The fourth principle, keep a living root in the soil. Living roots not only hold the soil in place, they also help build soil aggregates. Uh, the living roots are pumping uh, exudates off of their roots, uh, which feed a whole host of soil microorganisms, which feed our plants. And it's those, those exudates that are the glues that start holding those particles of sand, silt, and clay together and forming that aggregate in the soil. So the living, with, without a living root in the soil, 
I'm not sure you can build a soil aggregate. The living roots pump carbon into the soil. We were talking about that energy flow a while ago. Uh, we're taking that sunlight and turning it into something that's that's usable to the to the microbes in the soil. And a lot of that's in the form of carbon, liquid carbon. Uh, the carbon drives soil health. Like I said earlier, it's what the biology feeds on. Living roots are a key to properly functioning mineral cycle. And the diversity of living roots will cycle more nutrients in plant available form. We'll talk about diversity more here in a minute. But a single species of plant is going to do a, a, a specific thing. Another species is going to do another thing. So diversity of living roots will, will build or will promote uh, diversity and, and uh, soil aggregation better than a, than a single species will. And ideally, there should be a living root in the soil year-round. Here's an example of that same patch that the cabbage was planted in last fall and uh, some people including my mom looks at that and they get really, really, <laughs> ooh look at all those weeds out there. <laughs> what, what are you going to do about that? And I, I mentioned my mom because I, I started gardening under her tutorship when I was about this tall so I've learned a lot about gardening un under her but uh, she's, she still likes everything to be nice and clean and tidy looking and, and, uh, but we, we've gravitated more towards a garden that looks, looks like this, but there's lots of different living roots in here and, and in between these rows and around these plants, they aren't, they aren't competing at all with, with the crop I'm trying to grow. They're actually doing things that are beneficial to soil health. And diversity, the fifth principle, uh, nature's designed to collaborate, not compete. And I think we've, we, we don't often remember that, or maybe we don't think of that. We think of, especially when we're trying to grow, grow crops, we're, we're constantly thinking of all the competition that we have out there with that crop. Uh, maybe not, you know, maybe, maybe that's not really what's going on. Is it, is it truly stealing the nutrients that the crop is needing to grow? Is it truly stealing the water? Not if you have all these things working the way they should be working. Uh, nature abhors a monoculture. Again, remember the Lakota saying all are related. Every plant grows for a specific purpose. Take advantage of that purpose. Uh, mix it up with a diversity of plants, microbes, insects, wildlife, Livestock, all of these things are, are important uh, for soil health. Not only in the ground, but above the ground as well. You know, the birds and the insects above the ground do, do things to support this process also. So let all these things work in harmony to build soil health. Uh, and when in balance, we don't see as much pest pressure or weed pressure. And what is a weed? I asked that question earlier and I, I, uh, quickly I got the right answer, but a weed's simply a plant whose virtues aren't yet recognized. <laughs> uh, it, it's, there, it, it's there for a purpose. Uh, when Canadian thistle grows, it's there for a purpose. And it's a low succession plant. And I mentioned Canadian thistle because we, we've had a fair bit over the last few years in, in some of our garden area. Um, but it's there for a purpose. It's cycling a certain uh, mineral. It's doing a certain job. And once that job's done, that, that the conditions won't be favorable for that plant any longer. And it's going to move to a higher succession. Something else is going to grow and take its place. So keep that in mind. Uh, some examples of diversity, uh, obviously diverse perennial pastures, multi-species cover crops, companion planting when we plant things. Uh, instead of just planting a single, a single crop, can we 
can we plant one, two or more crops together that complement each other and, and grow them together? Uh, interseeding, uh, we can have stacked enterprises, we can have multi-species grazing, but it's important to promote diversity everywhere that we can. Uh, just a picture of some perennial pasture that's decent amount of diversity in there. And when we're talking diversity, I, I don't know how many species of plants are in here, but I can, I can see a handful of them. Uh, and a handful is not really a diverse pasture. You know, once, uh, I can go around throughout different times of the year and I can probably count 20, 20 uh, at least a couple of dozen, you know, 25 or so different species of plants that are now starting to appear in, in our pastures. Uh, where they were once just two different species in, in the hay ground. Started out with an alfalfa orchard grass uh, hay crop in there. And that's evolving through this particular type of management that's now evolving into a more diverse uh, crop. You know, we've, like I said, I, I can find 20, 25 different species growing out there. Uh, some people that have been at this for a lot longer than me are are able to identify a hundred or more species out there in their pasture. So, uh, the six principles to integrate livestock. And sometimes this can be challenge, but challenging, but livestock, if managed properly, are a very, very, very powerful tool for soil health. And it's the fastest way that we can build soil health if they're used properly. Uh, Cattle return 80 to 90 percent of the nutrients they consume back onto the soil in usable form as either manure or urine, and they're producing meat at the same time. So you think about this, and, and I said I've, I've raised a lot of hay, sold a lot of hay in the past. I was taking that hay crop and cutting the entire thing off. And all those nutrients that are in that crop are being taken somewhere else and used somewhere else. Uh, you can liken it to a mining operation. You're exporting the nutrients from here to, to somewhere else. <clears throat> but with, and with livestock, that's not the case. And livestock also shed biology. Uh, through, they shed it through their saliva. They shed it through their manure and their urine. Uh, ruminant livestock are, are just big... Uh, fermentation vats and there's all kinds of, of life and biology in their gut and they're constantly shedding that when the when the when the ruminants taking a bite of that plant that saliva's getting on that plant and, and doing beneficial things and then like I say the manure and the urine are both laying in there in a usable form to the biology and or the plant. So we can use adaptive grazing to grow healthy plants or I mean healthy animals and healthy soil together. Grazing has been an essential, an essential component of all soils at one time or another. Uh, people say over and over that the, the fertility that either is or once was in the Great Plains is, is all largely due to the large herds of, of, li of not livestock but wildlife, bison and elk that used to move across there and do things that would, uh, you know, they were promoting this, this part of the process here. Uh, we even last fall got the chance to integrate livestock into our garden. And the first time I'd been able to do that, and I just happened to have the cattle on the home farm at a time when the garden now, all this over here is just cover crop. Um, there's some oats in there. There's some peas in there. There's some weeds in there. There's some sorghum sedan back here. But this, this was all cover crop. And like I said, I had the opportunity with the cattle right here in the, in the pasture just through the fence. And... I'd been wanting to get cattle on and have animal impact on the garden space for quite some time. So our cattle were broke to a single poly wire. We put a poly wire around where we wanted them in the garden and kept them out of where we didn't want them in the garden. 
and we put nearly a million pounds of cattle per acre on this piece of ground for a short period of time. Uh, in about an hour, it looked like that right there. <laughs> so they've, they've taken all of that and run it through their system. And of course, it doesn't make it, it doesn't make the complete journey through their system in, in the time that, that, uh, they're on this, in this hour. But they're urinating and dropping manure out here. So that's, that's helping. And this cleared this off, so to speak. And I say cleared it off. There's still a lot of residue out there, uh, keeping that soil surface armored. But, <clears throat> That allowed us to go in there in the fall and then plant and plant some fall crops in there right over, right over in this area where you see that tall sorghum sedan grass. Um, going the wrong way here. That's where we end up. That garlic patch I showed you earlier. That's where it went. So we've got a real nice stand of garlic out there right now. And this morning the garlic's up here about probably six inches tall. Uh, the six principles of soil health are universal. As I said earlier, you can take them anywhere, use them any place. No, they're they're going to work the same. Apply them and watch things grow. Uh, what are we looking at here? This is a potato patch. Uh, it's a no-till potato patch. We lay potatoes on the ground in the springtime and we cover them with hay mulch. And this was this was late summer. There's no weeds out there. You see a little sorghum sedan here and there. That's no big deal. Uh, no weed pressure that way. And when we go to harvest potatoes, we don't use a shovel. We just use our hands and we get down our hands and knees and dig under that mulch and there's the potatoes. So that covers the six principles of soil health, but there's some other things that go along with this that are just as important. Uh, there's three rules of adaptive stewardship as defined by understanding ag. The first rule is compounding. Everything we do has a compounding and cascading effect that is either positive or negative, never neutral. And I think that applies to a lot of things in life, but it certainly applies to, to soil health and, and these principles. The uh, next rule is the rule of disruption. Nature becomes stagnant if we settle into a routine with our management practices. Uh, introducing planned and periodic disruptions keep things moving forward. Uh, Dr. Alan Williams describes this uh, or explains this like an athlete. You know, an athlete that's trying to trying to advance and advance and advance. If you keep the same routine all the time, you're you're going to stall out. You're going to hit a plateau. You're going to hit a ceiling. You can't go any further. You have to plan disruptions in your in your routine to continue to, to move forward or you won't move forward and then the third rule of adaptive stewardship is diversity uh, nature never supports a monoculture you know we've talked about diversity a lot already but it's interesting that diversity shows up as an ecosystem process shows up as a principle and then it shows up as one of these rules of adaptive stewardship so you can't say enough about diversity uh, implement, implementation tools. I've heard people that have been down this road a lot longer than me and a lot wiser than me say that you need to manage for what you want, not what you don't want. And I'm starting to figure out that that's exactly right. You know, instead of going out here and trying to rid ourselves of what we don't want in the system, let's try to just manage and promote what we do want. Diverse perennial pastures are, that are adaptively grazed are the fastest way to progress. Uh, we can use no-till. We can use multi-species cover crops, warm seasons, cool seasons. We can use companion planting. Uh, in our walkways in our garden, I've started over the last couple of years, I've started using that as a, as a place to grow cover crops. And instead of either going through there and trying to till it and keep, keep the weeds from coming up, I'm, I'm letting cover crops grow up in there to, to, to support these principles that we're talking about. Uh, we can use mulch. We can use adaptive grazing. 
And let's talk just a little bit more about adaptive grazing. Uh, we're cycling the nutrients. Again, the, you know, when you put the, those forages into the animal, they're going through that animal and they're coming back out and, and in the form of their manure and urine landing on the soil. And, you know, how many times have you, well, let's, let's even say in your, in your front yard, uh, you know, if, you, if your dog goes out there and does his thing in the yard, what do, you, what do you see out there at some point a little while later? A nice little green spot where everything else is maybe not quite as, as lush and healthy looking. The same thing's happening when we're putting livestock out here on the soil. Um, the livestock are helping to armor the soil if, if they're used properly. Uh, that trample effect, uh, what's, what, what they're not eating, what they're, tra in, in what they're trampling, uh, armors that soil and you got to have a pretty high stocking density to get much trample effect. You know, I mentioned earlier about a million pounds of the acre on that garden. That's not what we always graze at, but, um, you can get decent trample effect with, oh, 70,000 to 150,000 pounds of, uh, per acre. Hoof action is, is, it's working some of that uh, material into the surface of the soil and it's also massaging that soil and, and, and stimulating bio, biological life in there. In adaptive grazing, we're using short grazing periods, uh, typically less than 24 hours, and we're, that's preventing the plants from becoming overgrazed. We'll talk about overgrazing here in just a second too, a little bit more. And, but the short graze period is followed by a very long rest period and recovery period that allows the plant time to recover and express itself. Um, in our system, we're shooting for at least 60 day rest periods between grazing. And in some cases, and often cases, I'd like to have uh, much more than that. We had one pasture that we rested last the last half of the growing season last year uh, for about 150 days. So we're able to accomplish specific goals with adaptive grazing. We can move from low succession plants to higher succession plants. We can rid the pasture of invasive species. Um, we're getting where we're going to run out of time here, but uh, Getting rid of Canadian thistle is, is certainly easy to do with, with this type of grazing. Uh, bale grazing, we can import some nutrients that way. Uh, we can apply the rule of disruption. We can put some planned disruptions in place here to, to advance things along. We can alter the stocking density, that's a disruption. We can alter paddock configurations, another disruption. We can move nutrients uh, to where they're needed. Uh, we can promote diversity, access the latent seed bank, and talk just a second about adaptive versus prescriptive. Uh, there, there's a if if you're prescriptive, you're going to hit that wall. You're going you're going to hit a certain plateau, and you're not going to go above that. But adaptive grazing, it gives you a lot of flexibility to do a lot of different things to accomplish some of these different goals and move things along much faster. Probably another, well, this is one of the most impactful slides that I've ever come across so far, uh, as far as our related to our solar panel. And it's talking about the leaf volume removed versus the root growth stoppage. So if we remove not more than 50% of the leaf volume of the plant, then we're going to have very little root growth stoppage, 2 to 4%. Once we go over that 50% threshold, at 60%, we get 50% root growth stoppage. At 80% removal, we get 100% root growth stoppage. Why is that important? This over here talks about it a little bit. Um, Here's a, here we've taken a plant and we've removed nearly the entire plant. So we've had 100% root growth stoppage. 
Um, five days later, we just got a little bit of plant left. Down here, we just we just took a portion of that plant, and five days later, look how much plant we've got more than what you know it's starting to grow back. But look at that solar panel, you know, so that we we're keeping a solar panel here as opposed to right here. Measuring tools, uh, shovels, your best measuring tool, cheap. Everybody has one. Uh, you go out there, dig around, see what's going on. Uh, thermometer to measure soil temperature, water infiltration ring, re refractometer, uh, and then there's some soil tests that are available to tell us what's going on too. The power of observation. Uh, this is very important in, in this process. You can't just do something and sit in the house and hope things are working. Uh, you need to get out here and see what's going on. If we know what's going on, we're going to know what to do in a situation. So let's use our senses to see what nature is telling us. Let's pay attention to what we're seeing, what we're hearing, what we're smelling, what we're feeling, what we're tasting. You know, let, let's let's you get out there and walk around and find out what's going on. Uh, Gabe Brown has a saying that, that really means a lot to me. He says, if you want to make small changes, change the way you do things. If you want to make big changes, change the way you see things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the results of building the soil health, we have improved nutrient density in our food, improved human health, improved resiliency in times of drought or in times of excess moisture. Uh, we're going to have less pest pressure. We're going to have more wildlife. We're going to need fewer purchased inputs. We're going to have increased profit margins. You know, let's focus on margins and not on yields. Everybody's sometimes focused on yield, but margins are a lot more important than the yield is. Uh, remember, healthy soil promotes healthy plants, which promote healthy animals. And you can build soil health by applying the six principles of the soil health to your operation. Uh, some resources that I'll make available and my contact information and I'd like to thank you for your interest in soil health. I'd like to thank Dr. Laura for inviting me and Purdue for putting this conference on. So thank you all. Any questions?